in search of soil. You know, when you think about soil and measuring data from it, you know, a lot of times when you measure something, there has to be a lot of knowns involved. Like you have to un fully understand what you are measuring. Is there a danger or this tendency of science and large companies to be too reductionist when it comes to soil and uh, implying A, B relationships? If A happens, then we expect B, where maybe soil is just so complex given our level of understanding now we could run a trial, get a certain result, and, and not really understand why we got that result. I know a lot of people who, who listen to the podcast, watch the videos, sometimes they'll question things and say, well, is there a study to support that? Is there a study to support that? And one thing I, I go back to in my mind when I hear that is sometimes there's just not a lot of studies on this stuff and there's not a lot of understanding around it. So there aren't the studies. So when you, when you think about where we are on the private and public sector, looking at science, are we too reductionist given our knowledge of all these complex relationships within the soil? Uh, you know, and the system is complex. That doesn't mean we can't understand it. It means that we need to appreciate that it's complex to begin with. And I'm never one for, you know, I think if you can measure things, uh, it, it'll help ultimately fill in the gaps in our, in our knowledge and help better understand that complexity. But it can be too much at times. Sometimes when you're talking to people, their eyes will just glaze over if you start talking about, you know, oligotrophic versus copiotrophic organisms and, and you know, the Haney te soil test versus uh, uh, chromic acid. And so I think what you have to be careful of, well, A, use terms that people can understand, you know, use language that, that's common to people, try to use analogies, uh, and, and, and recognize, too, that intuition uh, is, a, is a wonderful thing. You know, I remember as a kid, I, I grew up on a farm, a uh, horticultural farm. We grew specimen trees and azaleas and rhododendrons, also had, you know, many, many acres of raspberries. My mom would go out every day with a shovel and dig up a little piece of the field that she thought didn't look quite right to her. She thought looked really good, and she'd have me smell it and, and, and say, hey, you know, this, this smells good. This doesn't smell good. We've got to do something here. And oftentimes it was like too much water. It's standing water, so it had a swampy smell to it. Or she'd say, look, the soil isn't draining properly. And I think what modern science is doing is, is, is just trying to assign some quantifiable numbers to that basic innate human intuition. You know, because I, 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 I was reminded of that a couple of years ago when we were, we were working with a, a gas met portable FTIR. That's an infrared device that will allow you to measure the respiration of soil. You can, you can set, it has a collar, you set it down in the field, and it'll analyze how much CO2 is being emitted, how much nitrous oxide is being emitted. Uh, and you can quantify it. And I, I, thought, I, th I think of my mom every time I do that, that she basically was that $80,000 gas met portable FTIR. And she kind of had a sense of what she was doing. And so I think there's a mix that, you know, we as human beings probably do have a good perspective. Uh, breeders, when I was with, with Mycogen and, and, and I talked to our breeders, they could walk through a, a cornfield in terms of different, you know, cultivars that they were evaluating. But they didn't measure squat. They just looked at the thing, the plant, its color, its structure, and they, they were able to determine which ones were going to be the better ones. And ultimately, we did you know, morphological quantification and genetic tests and things like that. But I'd say nine times out of 10, the variety that was selected best based upon those scientific measurements was the one that the breeder inherently knew. So the human being is a, is a, is a pretty accurate diagnostic organ, organism, but you can't then layer that into a database and evaluate it and then share it with a lot of other people. You know, I've listened to some remarkable speakers, whether it's, you know, Gary uh, Zimmer or, or, you know, a whole variety of people, or you listen to like Kiss the Ground, the documentary that was just made, some Ray Archuleta. Um, but they can't be everywhere all the time. And so I think the, the, the ability now to collect data we might not have been able to collect or quantify before 
uh, putting it into a database and then using it to then understand and then communicate those principles to other people is a very good thing. But you just have to recognize that also with statistics, you know, there's 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 liars, damn liars, and statisticians is the old joke, right? That you can prove anything with with statistics, and so it, it's all something that you combine, and you got to use common sense when you're evaluating these things and talking about it. Mm -hmm. But the, the direct answer to your question is no, I don't think we're collecting too much data. I think more data is better. We just need to evaluate it in the proper way. Right. In your reference there, mycogen, if you go back to some of the early work there in the 80s, you're talking about pest control, biological control. What were some theories you were testing back then, and, and how did that play out over time? Well, you know, the theory at the time, and being a weed scientist, I was looking for biological control of weeds, and you would see you know, pathogens of any sort attacking a, a, a lamb's quarter or pigweed or whatever it happened to be, cyclopod was one we worked on with Alternaria, that if you were able to replicate that and put the, put the spores or put the vegetative cells out and, and, you know, create a rolling infection that you could control the weeds in the absence of chemical pesticides. Uh, and that's true, but there's also a thing called the disease triangle where you have to have the right environment, the right pathogen, and the right host. And if all three of those aren't just right, nothing happens. And so you might have the sickle pod and the alton area out there, but if there wasn't enough humidity and or residual moisture on those leaves, you wouldn't get the infestation and the infection. You know, by the way, a, a pathogen seldom totally kills its host. That's not an ecologically smart game plan. So you're never gonna get 100% control. But of course, we've also with, with the fact that, look, a few weeds here and there aren't, aren't, aren't necessarily a terrible thing. And you can hand hoe and do those for the rest of it. So the same thing would have applied to, to uh, 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 insect control, where we were using things uh, to, to create a rolling infection in different insects. Or we helped develop uh, uh, the sodium salt of oleic acid, excuse me, the potassium salt of oleic acid, which is commonly known to people as safer soap. We called it impede. And it's a, you know, it's a fatty acid, and, and I'm sure a lot of your users have probably used safer soap. But it basically melts the exoskeleton of soft-bodied insects, but leaves a lot of the harder ones, especially the beneficial insects, alone just fine. And so we worked on that. It was an organically registered product. And we even had a, a, a fatty acid called pelargonic acid that was a remarkable herbicide. Literally, you could spray it like on oxalis. You'd spray it and watch the oxalis melt within about 30 seconds. But the thing is, fence row to fence row, that product was about $180 per acre. Well, other than for specialized situations, homeowners, landscapes, things along those lines, spot control, it wasn't going to be economically yeah. feasible. So, you know, at Mycogen, I think we had a fair amount of success with different things that we were doing. But again, it had to be integrated and it had to be economic. And it didn't necessarily always give complete control. It gave good control, but certain people wanted to see complete control at the time as well. Uh, we weren't working on soil health. You know, ironically, my wife's a plant pathologist, and she worked for a company called Advanced Genetic Sciences in Berkeley uh, during the early 80s. And she and, you know, Trevor Suslow, her boss at the time, who I think is at UC Davis now, uh, we're working on exactly what we're working on at Locus today, looking for microbes as soil amendments to improve yield and quality and, and soil health. Uh, but they, the tools they had to do that were basically, okay, let's, let's recover some things from the soil, brew them up, put them back, and see if we can improve upon productivity compared to the controls. Today, we can do a lot of measurements to help us understand how to how to optimize that and, and bring that technology along a little faster. So I think it's all been there for a while, but we're just getting better at trying to understand the biology. Being a weed scientist, what are your thoughts on weeds and their function and succession of a landscape? There's, there's something I've heard always on you know, the more regen ag side, the permaculture side of you know, weeds are soil indicators. They're going to tell you what's going on in your soil and they're there for a function. And if, if you continue that theory out over time, once that issue within that soil is repaired by the weed, which is there to repair, then the soil 
gets to a point where weeds are no longer needed because there isn't a function in the soil that needs to be repaired. When I explain that, or if you hear that, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I am a weed scientist. I'm actually elected fellow of the Weed Science Society of America. Right. And when I was in graduate school, uh, Bob Zimdahl was my advisor at Colorado State when I was working on my PhD. And I wrote a term paper called In, in Defense of Weeds, which addressed some of this. I'm a systems ecologist, or at least I like to think of myself as a systems ecologist. I got an undergraduate degree in biology from Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, and we just did a lot of ecological measurements. Uh, so I'm, you know, I, 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 I agree with the majority of what you just said. Weeds are an indicator. Now, there's no doubt weeds compete for nutrients, water, and a whole variety of things. Harold Coble at North Carolina State University and many other people back in the 70s and 80s did a lot of work that if you get a certain weed population density in the presence of the crop, you've got a problem. But I kind of look at weeds sometimes as, as cover crops, right? I mentioned Gary Zimmer before. Gary taught me no brown soil ever. And I'm, I'm sure people that you've talked to have talked about this as well. Bare soil is a travesty. Because uh, in essence, whether it's a cover crop or more better, a, 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 a mixture of cover crops, weeds could be the same thing. Those plants are, are, are capturing CO2 from the, from the atmosphere, photosynthesizing it. And any normal plant will exude anywhere from about 20 to 40% of its photosynthate out through its roots to feed the microbes below it. So if there aren't any plants in the soil at any particular point in time, you're not feeding those microbes and you know they're not going to be there, at least at the population densities. They're going to go dormant or they're going to go away. Uh, and so I think weeds are an indicator species. I did my PhD thesis on weed seed you know, ecology there literally are billions of weed seeds that are present in any acre of soil, and, and, and they, they can survive for 100, 150 years. There's a Dr. Beal's uh, you know, seed experiment at Ohio State, I remember from the 1980s, that he had started 100 years before, and you're still getting seeds that were viable after 100 years. And that's a whole another you know, amazing conversation to have is how can that be, because they actually are respiring. But weeds come up as that they are pioneer organisms. In other words, if you have bare soil, what's the first thing you generally see? A bunch of weeds sprout up. Uh, weed seeds are normally dormant, but when they're hit with direct sunlight, that's red light, that, that'll break their dormancy. Uh, when other species begin to grow as well, uh, more of the secondary species, light gets filtered through that canopy and it becomes a far red source, and that's generally inhibitory to weeds to grow. So there's ecological principles, but I think if we want to be kind of anthropomorphic about it, I agree. I think weeds are telling you something. Number one, nature abhors a vacuum, and and if you have bare soil, something's going to grow there, and that gets things started in terms of, you know, kickstarting the biology of that soil, especially the microbial population, uh, and kind of setting the stage for nutrient recycling, organic matter, a whole variety of things that ultimately are going to be beneficial to whatever secondary organisms coming in, whether it's a natural, you know, forest situation and, and you, you eventually get, uh, uh, you know, a, a canopy and, and more of a, of a mature forest, for example, after a couple hundred years. Or you come in there and, and you plant corn or soybeans or alfalfa or whatever it happens to be and are, are, are trying to establish that as your kind of dominant crop. But, yeah. Um, I, I think weeds and cover crops are, are probably closely related in terms of what they do. Uh, a cover crop is a little bit more manageable in terms of seeding density and you know, the types of things we know it'll contribute to the soil. But yeah, I, I think you can learn a lot from watching weeds and looking at population, population density of weeds in your, in your soil. I think ultimately when you get your crop established, you want to be very careful about letting them grow because they will steal water and nutrients from the crop and, and, and cause some issues. In terms of stealing water and nutrients from the crop, is that offset at all by having potentially another biological layer within the soil? So let's say you have a cornfield. That corn's growing tall. It's up in the air. It has a certain root profile it's putting out. And then let's say you have purslane growing in the soil. It's flat on the soil. It's covering areas of the soil the corn couldn't. It probably has a different root profile. 
they could be competing, but is there also some offset of that competition to a net positive given the purse lane there? And maybe that's doing things that are helping. So it's not just a total, let's say, uh, 10 minus five. It might be 10 minus five plus two. That's a really good analogy. You know, it's interesting you had mentioned purse lane. I don't know if you've ever had purse lane salad, but purse lane is very good <laughs> uh, 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 weed to eat. And, you know, the, 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 the definition of a weed, by the way, is a plant out of place. And so in your situation, can you really call purse lane a weed in that particular situation? Is it out of place? It's potentially contributing something. And I would agree with you. I mean, I, I, I've done a lot of work in India. And if you go to an Indian sugarcane field, for example, or corn or soybeans, you'll see them growing corn or alfalfa or soybeans or turmeric or all kinds of things in the rows before the canopy closes on the sugarcane. Uh, and you know, hey, they're getting a yield from it. But I think what we'll find in time that those crops are contributing you know, complex carbohydrates to the soil that actually benefits the sugarcane. Because I think you know, what we're learning is that any plant actually provides that useful function. It, it, uh, it'll draw CO2 out of the atmosphere, you know, convert it to a complex carbohydrate, uh, if, you know, uh, exude some of those carbohydrates and other nutrient-rich materials from their roots to feed the microbes. The microbes in turn will, will, will capture that, consume it as a food, and if they have certain functionalities like nutrient recycling, you know, liberating manganese, iron, magnesium, phosphates uh, from the soil and putting them in a form the plant can use, or that their, their biomass, you know, accumulates and gets deposited as organic matter will help hold water. Yeah, you, you could make a case that, that, you know, that purslane, to use your specific example, actually was potentially adding to that. Because if the purse lane is underneath a canopy of corn, for example, I wouldn't worry about trying to control it because it's not going to be very effective because it's, it, it's again, you know, now getting that far red light and, and it's going to be limited in terms of what it might be able to do anyway. Yeah. If, if you look at it, well, maybe two definitions of weed. You have a plan out of place and then you have it, it, it's performing a soil reparative function. Do you think if you had healthy enough soil, you could create soil conditions that would not allow weeds to grow? Or do you just, or does that theory not hold weight? Well, it, it does. I, it's simply, if nothing else from the canopy I talked about, if you get enough of a canopy and if you, and if, if you get a, enough plant residue, you know, I also, I also uh, back in the early 80s, I was an assistant professor of agronomy at the University of Kentucky. And they were very involved in what is today, you know, the development of what's now called conservation tillage or no tillage. We called it trash farming back in those days in Kentucky. Because uh, you just had, you had a bunch of crop residue on the, on the field and you would plant directly into it with, yeah. the, with the knife. Well, if you, have, if you have that residue on the soil surface, it's gonna it's gonna inhibit weed seed germination. Uh, it's gonna allow for better infiltration of water. And if you then get the crop canopy up and going, you, yeah, you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna see many weeds. And, and a lot of people too, even if you get some weeds, uh, you can go in there with a, like a like a, a, a Lemke cultivator or a, a, a crimper, and just do very shallow tillage. You know, no-till is one thing. I I, I think you know. The top five centimeters of soil, you can you can get away with, with with doing some tillage to incorporate some of that residue, get it interacting with the soil so it'll degrade, but also to control weeds. I you know I talk about Gary Zimmer, and I apologize for using it all the time, but he's a god in my mind. <laughs> it's, I really love him, but he took me to one of his organic fields, and and literally I could there was not a weed anywhere. It was a cornfield. I said you're lying to me. <laughs> There's no way this is an organic field. And so he explained to me the types of things that I was just talking about there. And so, you know, the answer is absolutely yes. You can, you can farm to a certain extent without using herbicides. If you have Johnson grass or some perennial weed or Canada thistle, might be a different story, you know, because, you know, those perennial weeds will kind of be able to exude, you know, or, or, you know, overcome some of that. But I think for the most part, if you can, if you can um, use the right types of practices, you could probably reduce weed control to spot treatment, 
as opposed to fence row to fence row broadcast herbicides. You look at common cultivated herbaceous plants, tomato, lettuce, basil, those types of plants. Are they higher up on the succession order than weeds? Since most of those have been bred out from wild plants, which some like nightshade we would consider weeds today, are are they on the same kind of plant level as a weed? The reason I ask is because people I go, go to this relationship thing. Well, if you improve soil, succession occurs and you move up to higher order species. And if you are trying to improve your soil as a farmer, are weeds and plants you want to grow really on the same succession level because they, they came from the same lineage? So where if it was, say, weeds and, and berries or weeds and trees, now you're moving higher up. Yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, it all comes back to to the robustness of the plant's you know ability to interact with its environment, uh, and creating an environment from an agricultural perspective that favors the crop you're trying to optimize, uh, and and puts things you don't want there at a disadvantage. And you tilt the the field in your favor, literally, with shallow tillage cover crops, you know, establishing a, a good canopy. Uh, and, and, you know, all of a sudden the, the plant that you're looking to, to, to optimize, the tomato or the pepper, yeah, that's a good analogy because there are like nightshade, you know, common nightshade is, is a weed. Uh, and they probably are from a genetic, you know, viewpoint, probably similar in terms of, you know, how they deal with the environment. But you've you've used agricultural practices to put your crop at, at an advantage, uh, you know, and and certainly you're not ever going to get to the point in a normal agricultural field where you're going to be planting trees, you know, conifers or things like that, unless you decide to change. You may go from uh, 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 a crop to uh, putting in pasture. People do things like that. Uh, so there are some you know major transitions in going from agricultural crops. To to like pasture or rangeland, or you switch from from uh, an annual crop like uh, strawberries or tomatoes, and then plant almonds or grapes or things along those lines or alfalfa. Uh, but I think in general, you know, any crop has an ability to succeed in the environment you create for it, and any weed, you know, uh, is, is going to try its best to do that as well. And that's where the agricultural practices come in why it's important understanding what you, each one contributes to that, to that ecosystem in order to be able to achieve what you're trying to do, yet still retain the health and the sustainability of that soil. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to borrow from that soil in years one, two, and three, and then be paying for it, you know, in years five through 50, because you, you, you didn't farm in a, in a sustainable way or, or even farm now in a regenerative way that actually, you know, built soil. Because farming is all about Growing soil, you know, Ray Archuleta talks about that. You know, we're trying to grow soil. And a lot of people have a hard time trying to understand, well, what does that mean? What well, means you're trying to build biomass and, and nurture the microbes and, and get all that together so that when you do put your crop into it, it actually benefits from that and adds to the ability to grow soil. Crop productivity and soil health are two sides of the same coin. One contributes to the other. When you look at weed growth itself, is there... Are there different microbial relationships between different types of weeds? So you have oxalis, you have splurge, you have lamb's quarter, you have purslane. Are, you know, one thing people could say is, well, they're repairing the soil by what they do. They create above ground biomass and they have some sort of root, whether that's a, a mat of roots or that's a deeper tap root that goes down and, and does something to compaction. But it's doing it in concert with microbes. Do different weeds have different relationships with different microbes? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but I think in time, a very short period of time, we're gonna be able to determine that. So I'll back up a, a little bit. Now I'm gonna mention a company that we're starting to work with called Biome Makers, B-I-O-M-E, uh, Space Makers, M-A-K-E-R-S. And, and they have some really cool technology in terms of being not only to use metagenomics and, and sequencing to determine who's there in terms of the microbes, 
but also what function they perform, because that's actually even more important. That's okay. It, it's fine to determine from a metagenomic sequence what organisms are present, but you really need to know what functionality they're providing. So set that aside for a minute, and then think about the, 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 I think the general consensus in the agricultural community is that a single cover crop is not as good as multiple species in a, in a cover crop. You know, vetches, legumes, grasses, tillage radishes. Tillage radishes put this huge, beautiful root down, right? And we'll break up hard pan. Well, what we don't know from a scientific viewpoint, or I don't know of any papers right now, I'm sure there are probably people out there that actually have looked at this and I'm just not aware of it, uh, is, all right, your question, do, do those different species contribute different types of complex nutrients that will stimulate a broader range of microbes and therefore a broader range of functionality into that metagenome, that rhizosphere? And I suspect the answer is a hearty yes, because I think that's, that's, that's demonstrated by the fact that anybody that talks about cover crops will really encourage you to use several different species of cover crops than just a single one. That diversity is a good thing. So when, where then has, well, let's compare two paths that agriculture has taken on really the, the science and the corporate side of things. Is one path is, I'll call it the regenerative ag side. It's cover crops, it's no-till, it's nurturing biology to build soil to get a higher yield. Yet traditional ag or conventional ag has gone after, we're going to chase yield via maybe methods that don't directly encourage biological soil building. So we could fertilize, we could till, we could spray to get more yield. And if you look at the yield curve of things like corn and soybeans over time, those yields have gone up tremendously. Where, where do you think the chemical side of ag starts to top out in terms of yield potential? And is that method of agriculture really depleting soils over time because it isn't building biology as much as is a more regenerative system? And on the flip side, what do you think is possible for regenerative systems that use different microbial products uh, like you guys produce and also just basic things like no-till and cover crops? Can, can the biological side of things catch up to where conventional is? Well, the answer to that last question is yes, because conventional embraces biology. Conventional embraces regeneration. Uh, I mean, if you go all the way to one side and say, okay, I'm going to moldboard plow, you know, 18 inches deep, 12 inches deep, and I'm going to use 150 pounds of N, you know, and, and X pounds of phosphate, and I'm going to, to, you know, just control everything with herbicides or insecticides and fungicides. Yeah, you, you got a problem. But I would, I would have to say that you know, that, you know, that's not conventional farming anymore. People are adopting no-till. People are adopting strip tillage. People are adopting conservation tillage. People are recognizing that, look, I, I can save on input costs by reducing the amount of fertilizer I'm using, but I recognize that too much nitrogen, too much phosphate, too much potassium actually inhibits microbial growth. Like Michael Wright, you put too much phosphate yeah, you, you slow down, if not, you know, put in stasis, you know, mycorrhizal activity. Um, people recognize that, that well, I, 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 I can use tillage in certain places to control weeds. I don't necessarily have to go fence row to fence row with a broadcast herbicide. Because uh, all those things are inputs. They cost money. Uh, and so if you can do it more effectively by creating a more sustainable farming system and, and lower what you're doing, have greater output versus lower inputs, then you increase your on farm income. And so, you know, I mean, maybe your question was, well, can you divide a line between good and bad? Well, I, I don't think you can do that today. I think the majority of growers, A, they care a lot about their ground. They're going to use what tools they need to, but they recognize that that regenerative practices are really important to everybody. And I see, you know, uh, rapidly advancing recognition of that and rapidly advancing desire to learn more about how to do that. 
I work at the grower uh, Rorick Palman in western Nebraska. It's 10,000 acres of uh, corn, field corn, soybeans, and popcorn. Uh, and he's a remarkable man. He's looking at water conservation. He's, he's, he's looking at all kinds of practice. He has his own smart farm initiative where he's involved several faculty from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, IBM, Granular, uh, uh, cell phone company, you know, a whole variety of people where he's invited them to come to his farm and, and, and do things and then collect the data, then working with, uh, you know, professors at the Univers University of Nebraska-Lincoln that are really skilled in data analysis and artificial intelligence to kind of help him not only figure out what's good for his farm, but then do the outreach necessary to teach his neighbors about it so his neighbors can teach their neighbors. Right. Uh, I, see, I see a sea change in people's attitude about this over the last five years uh, and the desire to, to embrace and, and, and practice regenerative agriculture. I don't see a lot of deep tillage. I see some, uh, but you don't see a lot of it anymore. You still see people, you know, uh, uh, you know, with brown soil or, or you know, not planting a cover crop or things along those lines. But I think as as that knowledge gets spread around, people are recognizing that's an important thing to do, and and beginning to embrace it. Don't you, at some point, if you If you say microbes in the relationship they have with plants are based upon inputs in the soil. So if I fertilize a plant with something I add to the soil, then the plant says, well, I don't have to go maybe form this relationship with this microbe to go get it because I can just suck it up right here. You gave it to me. If, if you are in an input based ag model, whatever that is, conventional or organic, are you stunting the biological potential of the soil by just giving plants what they need versus dialing inputs back and forcing plants and the soil microbiome to generate what the plant needs? Well, I think forcing is the wrong term. I think allowing is a better term. It's a natural ecosystem. So nothing's being forced. So let me back up. You know, the, the, the advice given by a lot of people these days is feed the soil, not the plant. For exactly the reasons that you're talking about, that look, if you feed the soil, the soil will feed the plant. Yeah, we do a lot of work in Florida, and you know, Florida was built on a bed of dinosaur bones. There's a lot of you know insoluble phosphate in, in Florida soils. If you have the right microbial populations, they will liberate phosphate to, to feed the plant. And you don't necessarily need to be applying in many situations, need to be applying a lot of inorganic phosphate. Um, but I think what we're what we're seeing is is a, the plant needs a healthy root rhizosphere. In other words, it needs a population of microbes in its root system in order to help create those conditions where the plant can effectively interact with the soil in order to, to get those things it needs to produce an optimal crop. You know, you're 10 times as many human cells sitting here today. I'm 10 times as many, 10 times as many bacterial cells as human cells. And so am I. And without all those bacterial cells, especially in your in your gut and in your intestines, yeah, you wouldn't be functioning. And so I think we've learned that we want to take probiotics, but we also want to take prebiotics, you know, uh, you know, fiber things to feed those microbes. We want to be careful in terms of taking penicillin because uh, uh, it'll it'll knock the heck out of that microbiome. Well, plants are no different. Uh, those plant roots need that microbiome, and that plant will actually nurture them. It'll exude those complex carbohydrates and nutrients, as I talked about earlier, in order to uh, optimize the population, or at least grow the population of those microbes. But then those microbes interact with each other as well, because uh, they're performing a whole bunch of functions. You know, we kind of talked about it's not who's there, it's what function do they provide. And so it's a it's a, a a matter of getting organisms that will liberate uh, micronutrients like uh, magnesium and zinc and iron and those things that the that the plant needs. You have free living microbes that will fix nitrogen, Azotobacter, uh, Agrobacteria. We all know about rhizobium and its interaction with with legume crops. 
but there are lots of free living nitrogen fixing microbes that, that are important that can really remarkably you know, reduce the amount of inorganic nitrogen needed because they can capture it from the atmosphere. So I think it comes back to if you can allow those ecological relationships to form and don't get in the way of them, uh, you, you, you can really create a system that needs, you know, certainly a drastically reduced amount of conventional inputs. And the things that interfere with that are deep tillage, not shallow tillage, I don't think, but deep tillage. And other people might argue with that. I'm just giving you my opinion. Some people say, well, no tillage whatsoever. I do think shallow tillage is probably just fine. Or over applying nitrogen and phosphate really will shut down some of the uh, microbial biology because it signals the, the microbe like mycorrhiza and phosphate. It signals the mycorrhiza, well, I've got enough phosphate liberated around here. I don't need to be digging any more up. Uh, and then that process slows down. Uh, so, like I say, you have to look at it as, a, as an ecosystem, as a, as a balanced system where the microbes really are going to do a, a lot, not only for the soil, but for that plant. They're constantly communicating with each other. Say somebody's in a no-till situation, they have cover crops that they're growing, like they're doing what they can via management practices to encourage soil growth. If you wanted to I'll say fast track, um, and maybe slow track on a long ecological scale, things along in terms of building soil. Do you think adding microbes to the soil makes sense? My initial answer is yes. And I have to admit, I have a conflict of interest. I work for a company that sells microbial soil inoculants, right? And so what we see is, is when you... When you add select species to a natural environment, you generally will see a response in terms of greater productivity. It's not just us, it's other people as well. But you don't see it consistently. That's one of the things about microbial soil inoculants. They're generally considered inconsistent at best in snake oil at worst, right? Uh, but they do work. Um, and so the question becomes, well, well, why is that? Why couldn't you just develop a natural population to do that same thing. And again, to go back to Midwestern Bioag and Gary Zimmer, you know, they will feed humic acid and they'll use no-till and they'll do a lot of things. And over time, their, their hypothesis was, well, we can, and, and, and also composting, that, that we can build that up more naturally than, than applying a, a direct fed microbial, if you will, a microbial soil amendment. Now, the fault in that logic is what is manure? Or what is, you know, running, running sheep or cattle over a field, you know, well, you're adding microbes. Uh, that's what manure is. It's, it's a prebiotic and a probiotic. You know, think of the microbes we're adding as probiotics, agricultural probiotics. And oftentimes you need to have a, what we call a microbial food supplement, kelp extract, uh, humic acid, molasses. You know, in India, we use mill mud, you know, all the residue of, of crushing the, uh, crushing the sugar cane and putting back everything but the sugar back on the field. Um, so that's kind of akin to, to, to feeding the soil with particular microbes. And, and we can talk about why I, why I think that's useful. Um, well, let's but, do that. Why do you think that's useful? Yeah, okay. So, and Gary Harmon, uh, who's a professor, a retired professor at Cornell, wrote, wrote a really nice paper on, on trichoderma review paper. Uh, and he talks about trichoderma in particular and other, you know, soil fungi and microbes and, and, and talks about the fact that there are certain microbes that really do seem to, even if they're naturally present, like many trichoderma species are naturally present in the soil. But sometimes population density makes a real difference. It's like a probiotic. You know, people would argue, I will, I'm going to answer your question here in a minute. I realize I'm circling around it. No, that's okay. But you know, if you're not taking a probiotic, you should be. But some people would say, well, if you drink kombucha and eat, you know, raw sauerkraut and, and, and uh, kimchi and things along those lines, you'll be just fine. Yet there's a body of scientific evidence that say, look, there are certain probiotics that are better than just trying to get it all from your, from your environment. Well, the same thing with, with uh, agricultural probiotics. And there's a thing called quorum sensing. Uh, do, you, do you know what quorum sensing is? Or maybe some of your listeners would not know what it yeah, is. Ex explain that. 
Yeah, okay, so quorum sensing, the, the, the best analogy I can, I can make is like you're sitting at a party and, and you know, it's midnight and it's really not very exciting and you're about ready to, to signal to your friends, hey, let's, let's go home or go somewhere else. Well, all of a sudden somebody shows up with live music and alcohol uh, and, and boy, things really start, start to click. Well, that's quorum sensing. And it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think a, a relatively well accepted scientific principle that microbes practice quorum sensing. That there are certain microbes that will stimulate activity in others. In other words, it is kind of interesting that you know you've you've got a billion cells per gram of soil already in most soils. So you got people like us, you know, taking rhizolizer and putting it into the field, which which isn't nearly that that density and you're magically getting these responses and you do get them. Uh, we see you know, increases of 20% to 80% in, in certain crops with the addition of our trichoderma plus bacillus combination. And so you kind of think, well, well, how are they competing? Well, they may not be competing with those other microbes, they may actually be turning them on. And a, a good kind of, kind of anecdote I have for that, I worked for Diversa Corporation here in San Diego for a long time. Um, Diversa uh, was instrumental in the development of the field of, of environmental sequencing, which is now known as metagenomics. Environmental sequencing means you just go in there and you just sequence everything. You know, 99% of the microbes in the world aren't culturable. You know, we can find them through metagenomics, but we can't actually make them grow. Uh, and so we did a lot of environmental sequencing, and you could eventually, through annotation, determine, okay, there's all these different species there. But we're always frustrated by the fact, and this is the, the mid-2000s, that, okay, we, we didn't know what the culture looked like or we couldn't culture them. So uh, Eric Mather uh, and, and his team got together, and they were able to encapsulate one or two cells in a gel bead that was permeable. Then they would extract the cells from the ocean, a peat bog, soil, whatever it happened to be, pack a column with those gel beads and then run a solution of soil extract or ocean water, whatever it happened to be through that. And lo and behold, things just started to grow like crazy. Uh, and, and, and the message to me was that they were all communicating. In other words, when you try to use Cook's principles, right, which is a single organism, you know, on a plate and, 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 and get it to grow independently, well, these are social creatures. They won't grow oftentimes independently. They need each other. And, and they need certain signals. So quorum sensing to me, and the, the, the reason I think cert, you know, uh, 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 soil amendments, microbial soil amendments work as long as they're alive you know, and fresh and are put out at high enough density and they're put out with things that they can feed on, these microbial food supplements, we should, we should talk about that, that they may be acting as quorum sensing. In other words, they're completing that picture. And the kind of the other analogy of that that I use is like you buy a, buy a Ford F-150 all tricked out uh, and, and it's got gas in the tank, but you forgot to put a steering wheel in it. Well, you're not going anywhere. Or you go, I played French horn in, in, in uh, uh, high school in the symphony orchestra. And if you went to a full orchestra with everybody there, it's just a wonderful experience. But if you leave out, especially if you leave out the French horns, uh, but also the violins, it's just not going to be the same thing. Nobody's going to perform as well. And so I think what happens with those organisms that we have found work well as microbial soil amendments are acting to improve everybody around them. They're acting to a certain extent as quorum sensors that will actually cause, uh, cause that whole ecosystem now to bloom a little bit you know, more pro, you know, uh, prolifically uh, and get everybody involved in creating the functionality you want to create the optimal environment for that crop to grow. Is this the case then that anything you can do to add microbes to your soil would probably be beneficial? It's just a question of how beneficial. So if I think about traditional ag, if we look around the world, you have biodynamics, you have Korean natural farming, you have composting, you have people doing compost teas. Are, do you think that just blanketing all those things, that they're helpful? It's just a matter of how helpful they actually are? 
Well, I think you have to have the right, number one, you need to support the native microbiology that's there through all these regenerative practices that we've talked about, composting, cover crops, minimum tillage, a whole variety of that in order to, to you know, make as healthy as possible those microbes that are naturally in the soil. But I do believe, and like I said, I think composting is, is, is in this category, that if you're going to then add microbes or running your cattle over, over, your, over your pasture, uh, you're adding microbes, and that, that that will help stimulate those other organisms that are there to perform uh, uh, better. And I think it's a matter of having a functional metagenome. So let's talk about environmental sequencing in a, in a metagenome. What is that? Well, it, 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 it comes back to the symphony orchestra. We'll, we'll use that one as a continuing uh, uh, example. That, that you may have a microbe present, but it may not actually be actively growing until it, until it you know, gets stimulated to do so by another organism. And it could be that putting the right microbe in that particular metagenome will actually turn everybody else on. So ultimately, my answer is yes, that if you can find the right organisms that have the right functionality to complete that metagenome, to make it as functional as possible, uh, you're going to improve things. And I do think that you then also have to create an environment for that added microbial to do its job, which is typical regenerative practices. Like I said, you also, we feel, I feel, I think there's data to support it from other people as well, that you, 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 you want to, to add materials that that organism can use for food because uh, it, it needs to get started. And, and, you know, until it can get itself established with a growing crop and let the roots feed it, uh, it's going to have a hard time expressing that functionality that that whole metagenome needs. Uh, so, now, so it's almost like you're, you're, you're starting a business and you know initially maybe you need to accumulate some funds to buy inventory to get the business up and rolling then eventually that business is doing enough sales or services whatever it's doing that it can fund its own growth but without that initial injection of cash if you're just relying on sales from day one it might be a slow start or a no start yeah no i think that's a that's a reasonable and good analogy um you know the 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 other part of it is 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 also I think recognizing that the same set of microbes, at least the optimal set of microbes, are going to be different for citrus in Florida than for you know uh, uh, hops in Oregon and Washington. So all types are different. The climate is different. Or a microbe that you apply in February in cold soil might not be the same microbe you apply in July under warm soil conditions for different environments. And we're learning that ourselves within our own research. But I think ultimately where we're going to head is you're going to have prescribed cocktails that we're going to learn enough about the microbial functionality. And so I'll come back to this company, Biome Makers, I, I, I mentioned some time ago, that, that we're going to have a fingerprint, you know, of what a, what a, healthy metagenome looks like and what is optimal for that particular crop that will allow us to combine what's the best tillage practice, what's the best combination of cover crops, uh, do we add compost and from what, okay, what, what uh, uh, soil, microbial soil amendments should we apply and when, what microbial food source should be applied with those particular organisms, and it becomes a bit of a knowledge-intensive uh, agricultural program, but one that truly establishes an optimal ecological system that allows that crop to perform as 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 best as possible, but also build soil and and allows you to to create an ecological farming system that is going to be as productive ten years from now or even a hundred years from now as it is today. Fact, probably better because you've you've you begin to optimize that that uh, ecosystem. Is that why you say a lot of microbial solutions are considered inconsistent at best and snake oil at worst? Is because you have things for sale on the market and somebody tries to use it in a tropical soil in Florida, a sandy desert soil in Phoenix. 
and a, a wetter forest soil up in the Pacific Northwest. And what arrives in the bottle or the bag at all three of those locations is the same, yet there's different results. And somebody says it works great, and somebody's like, well, this didn't do anything. Well, I think there are a lot of factors there. Now, let's start with the first one, which is you better make sure that the potency of that is what it should be when it gets to the grower. These are live organisms, and when they're shipped around, you know, under hot conditions, sitting on loading docks and, you know, prolonged periods of time, uh, you can lose potency. And if you lose potency, you know, microbial biomass that's not alive doesn't, doesn't do much for you. So that's, that's part of it. Uh, another part is, I do believe you've got to have a, a, a microbial food source. You better be combining it with a prebiotic of some sort and to allow it to get better established in, in its environment. Number two, with the microbial soil amendment, you better make sure it actually gets down to the roots. You know, we apply all of our materials through drip irrigation or some type of irrigation system. We're developing a granule uh, that we can apply under a rain-fed situation, but you know, microbes don't do a lot of good if they're just sitting on the soil surface. They need to get down in the soil rhizosphere as well. Uh, and then, of course, you need to have those regenerative practices in place as well, uh, at least at least to the greatest extent you can, to provide you know those soil conditions that that are important for that microbe as well. So you put all that up in a bag and mix it up, and ultimately you end up with this inconsistency as well as what you just talked about. Well, do you have the right combination of microbes for that crop and that soil type? You know, we have a we have a fungal organism, trichoderma, and you know, a bacterial organism, Bacillus, and they're on purpose because they they pair well with each other. Uh, either one alone probably wouldn't be able to do the same job. Uh, and so, if you have microbial inoculants that don't pay attention to, you know, kind of an amplified functionality that you get from having both a, a fungal component and a microbial component, I don't think necessarily going to work as well as one that does. And you have to apply it a, at a, at a cost-effective mechanism. You know, growers can only pay so much. And two, we also have found that you do have to reapply them. They don't necessarily, and yet, well, hey, you also have to apply them at the right density. You, you, you can't, you know, put something out that isn't at a high enough population density to impact upon the rest of that microbial population that's there to truly do its job. So what we find too is we're generally applying optimally two, three, even four times a year in a perennial crop in order to keep that population density of that added microbe up to the point where it can serve as the conductor you know, of the orchestra that we, we described earlier to get everybody and keep everybody working at optimal peak efficiency. So if you have optimal density of that microbe, it's up here and you know, application after application, that keeps it topped off. What, what's what's stopping it in the natural system from naturalizing and, and ramping its own population up to these levels or beyond? Why, when you don't apply it, can what was applied not live and reproduce enough to push up to these higher levels? Well, I'm sure uh, there are many people that argue they should be able to. And I'm, I will tell you, I wish I knew the answer to that. Right now, our early research suggests that no, you got to you got to top it off from time to time. Uh, I think with like with the biomakers and their and their other other companies that can potentially do this as well, where you take a look at not only who's there but what function are they performing, we'll have an answer to what you're saying that will figure that out. That we'll see the combination of things that might allow a single application of a of a of a, a microbial soil amendment it'll be enough for a season at least. Uh, like I said, I, I think the folks at Midwestern BioAg often argued that, you know, if I, if I keep at this over a period of three or four or five years, I can get to the point where I can certainly see like a 20% increase in yield and a 20% decrease in inputs. Is that the most they could achieve? Could, they, could, they, could, could that kind of a system be improved even further faster? By adding a, a microbial soil amendment, I think so, because you do see with certain types of compost systems, and I know you've interviewed David Johnson at New Mexico State with his beam system. That's a remarkable system, and he inoculates it, right? And he puts it back out. He sees phenomenal increases in yield, but he also sees uh, much greater prevalence of 
fungal organisms in that soil. He gets, he gets a more fungal dominant soil. Well, those are all clues to, to what's going on. And, and my point on a microbial soil amendment, it's somewhat analogous to creating a, 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 an inoculum uh, in, in that, that would ultimately be represented by a composting system. Because what that composting system does is it provides both the probiotic and the prebiotic. You're, you're having a food source and you're having the microbes. I think I think a, a fermentation broth with um, highly dense and with with the right kind of prebiotic, in other words, the microbial food supplements, is potentially a little more scalable and more rapid than a composting system. But they also can is, exist in harmony really, really well. Yeah, like an analogy you used before when we were talking is you know what is what are microbes in their second generation compost? It's compost that's broken right. down and eight and now you have the microbes left if you think okay well well some is good well more should be better and if money wasn't an object and i don't know the rates of application of a rhizolizer that you guys have but let's say it's a gallon per acre if you did a hundred gallons per acre could you expect like exponentially better results or yeah. well, it's interesting rhizolizer application rates are three ounces per acre by the way okay. uh along with six ounces of microbial food supplement so we'll start there and we have tested 10x that and we do see an improvement we don't see any any negative impact but at some point in time you get a plateau that it, it only goes up so far because we do test to, to make sure we don't see any negative implications of applying too much material. Uh, and, 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 and we don't. But if you apply instead of three ounces, if you apply uh, uh, nine ounces or 15 ounces, we'll see a, 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 an impact. Uh, but that impact will gradually diminish. It, it still is maintained. And it's also a function of, of the soil type. We generally find that we actually work a little better on heavier soils, more organic matter soils than we do on sandier soils. And that, that on sandier soils, if we apply more material, we can kind of uh, reduce that gap. Mm. Uh, and that, that actually speaks to what we were talking about, too, in terms of quorum sensing, that you know, a heavier, more organic matter laden soil probably has a greater microbial population to start with. And therefore, the quorum sensing, you, know, you don't need as many rhizolizer conductors to, to stimulate what's going on. Yeah. Uh, but again, we need, we need those tests, like I mentioned with biomakers, where we can actually plot that out and, and, and truly take a look at not only the, the, the metagenomics, but the functionality in the, in the metabolomics. Are you familiar with the term proteomics or metabolomics? There's an omics for everything, right? Genomics. Uh, metagenomics, metabolomics, proteomics. Well, metabolomics is getting a sense for what metabolites are being exchanged. Because what happens is literally these microbes are populating that rhizosphere and they're sending little text messages in the form of chemical intermediates you know, to the plant. The plant's sending them back, communicating with each other that stimulates you know, gene expression in both the crop and the, and the microbiome. You know, when I was in school, uh, you always looked at yield potential as G by E, genetics by environment. Then it became G by E by N. Probably was at that point in time too. You know, genetics by environment by nutrition. But it's clear now it's G by E by N by M, microbial genome. And that a plant genome truly can't fully express itself. It doesn't have the right microbial genome associated with it because it makes it a more complete, stronger, functional metagenome because you look at that particular environment as being the crop and the microbes together, not just the crop, not just the microbes. Uh, and, and so what you're trying to do is to optimize that and keep it optimized by all the things that you know, we've talked about for the last hours or so here. And on the site, you have you know, pictures of plant roots with the rhizolizer product, product applied to the soil versus mm. it not. And the ones that are it's applied, you see a denser root ball, more roots. Why is that? What is happening between the plant and microbe in the soil that's causing the plant to put out more roots? Yeah. So 
you know, we, and we do. I always joke around that I think we could put roots on a, on a, on a baseball bat. Not a metal one, but a wooden one, I think. <laughs> uh, but we very seldom see an application where we don't see a remarkable increase in root mass, especially fibrous roots. You know, in Florida soils uh, with uh, citrus, we generally will see on average about an 80% increase in fibrous root mass. Of course, you're, you're starting from a low bar there because one of the impacts of citrus screening is that it, it pickles, they call it pickling of the root, it stunts the root, so we can get the plant to overcome that. And if you think about it, if, you're, if, you, if, if you double the size of the sphere, and I'm not saying all roots are spheres, but it's just a useful analogy. If you double the radius of the sphere of a sphere, you increase the volume eightfold. And so all of a sudden, you've got this remarkable increase in volume. As we talked about before, you're exuding a lot of complex carbohydrates from the crop you know, into the soil and feeding microbes, which in turn stimulate the plant. So if you're increasing things eightfold, you're probably getting a remarkable increase in both the depth and the breadth and the amount of complex carbohydrates that are there. So that's not answering your question, but what happens is those microbes are, are, are sending out through metabolic intermediates, those little text messages that are telling the crop, okay, I'm here, it's okay, you know, let's put some roots on, let's increase chlorophyll density. Uh, there, there are certain hormones that are produced by certain microbes, cytokines, abscisic acid, gibberellic acid, a whole variety of things along those lines. But I don't even think that's the major part of it. I think it's that genome to genome interaction where the right microbes with the right functionality are signaling the plant that we're here, we have a functional metagenome operating. Go ahead and put some more roots down because we are, I'm being very anthropomorphic here, but we are, we are here and we're solubilizing nutrients. We're fixing nitrogen. We're doing all this stuff. And so if you expand your root system, you're going to find a lot of good stuff that, 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 that the energy you put into growing roots is worth it because we're here and we're going to be able to return more on that investment of you putting roots down. Because uh, what you also see associated with that generally is an increase in leaf chlorophyll density, which should mean greater photosynthetic flux which should mean greater exudates in the soil, which should mean greater microbial growth, which by the way, with the right kind of microbes, and we should talk about this, generally results in increased organic matter. And we all know that organic matter is also very good, especially if it's in the form of, of making a, a, a lot of both micro and macro soil aggregates mm. that are important for aeration and water holding capacity and all the rest of those things as well. So I, I think there, we're stimulating that root growth because of the metabolic interaction between that microbial genome and the plant genome. Yeah, and the plant is saying, I, I'll agree, I'll put out more roots in exchange for what you're offering. So it's taking that trade on. You know, a, a farmer is asking that same question. They're going to say, well, you know, these products, they sound interesting. Can they benefit my yield? Like I'm going to trade dollars for product, which then results in more yield for me. A lot of people listening to this are on the vegetable side. Can you talk about some of the studies and trials you guys have done on the vegetable side and what you've seen when sure, applying? Yeah. No, that... we, we have worked extensively on tomatoes and peppers. Uh, I, I will admit we started off predominantly in permanent crops, uh, citrus greening in Florida, uh, uh, sod, blueberries, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fold strawberries into a into a vegetable crop. I realize it's a fruit and it could be a perennial, but uh, oftentimes it's farmed as an annual. Uh, but generally, what we see is a you know a thirty to forty percent increase in yield. To potatoes, I will put in there as well. And what we'll see is the crop the crop will jump out of the ground faster. Like in potatoes, we did a study in Imperial Valley where we treated every other row with rhizolizer. Uh, and literally the rhizolider treated rows were out of the ground 10 days before the non-treated rows. And the grower came by and, oh my God, what did you do to my field? <laughs> you've, you know, you've killed every other row. It's like, no, no. You know, everything that was treated is just up. Wait for it. And sure enough, eventually those others came up and they were very excited because in a cold, wet season, you know, they could maybe get the, ground out, the, the crop out of the ground faster and get it to market faster with that. And then we see anywhere in potatoes from a 7% to a 40% increase in yield, but almost uniformly, 
we will see uh, uh, more into class A or, or versus class B or US number ones versus US number twos. Um, in tomatoes, we generally see higher bricks, more yield. Peppers, greater yield. In strawberries, uh, we see larger fruit. We can turn like a 20 count box into an 18 count box. Strawberries, it goes backwards, by the way. A larger fruit is a smaller count box. Uh, and, and generally increased bricks, increased color. Uh, and several of our growers have self-reported that they've been able to, to reduce uh, NPK applications by anywhere from 15, 20, and in one case, one grower could reduce it by 40% in Florida and very sandy soils. And my belief in that is, well, number one, we increase, because we generally see an increase in, in nutrient uptake, nitrogen, phosphorus, things along those lines, into the plant. We generally see an increase in leaf chlorophyll density, uh, but we see those deeper roots and expanded root system. And so in a sandy soil, if you've got a, a deeper, more voluminous root mass, well, you're not going to, in a sandy soil, in a heavy rainfall climate, you're not going to get it washed down below the root mass as easy, so therefore you ought to be able to use less because it's, it's got a greater capacity of taking it up throughout a, a, a deeper soil profile. So all those things go into, into you, know, the, the, you know, the annual crops and the vegetable crops and things that, that, we have, that we have worked on. How do you guys address the location issue or my biome issue? If I'm in California, somebody else is in Quebec, and somebody's in Florida, are we getting the same jug of stuff? Well, you are getting the same jug of stuff uh, at this particular point in time, although we're introducing, uh, there's Rhizolizer, we're introducing a product called Pantego, which is a yeast that is, it has similar performance characteristics, but A, it's a yeast, and B, it has a, a, a different climatic profile. It'll, it'll grow better and perform better under cooler soils than Rhizolizer will. Uh, but we also will adjust uh, uh, the application rate, like six ounces instead of instead of three ounces, four applications a season as opposed to two applications a season. And right now we're working to develop an azotobacter, a free living nitrogen fixing microbe, and taking a look at other things in order to to add to that cocktail, realizing that we have a great foundational product, uh, but that we want to then you know optimize it for specific regions, if not you know fields. Uh, and we'll, so we're, we're, we're working very closely internally, but with people like biomakers and others to get a handle on, okay, no kidding, what's going on? What can we do to follow the population ecology of what we put down versus what's there and the impact upon it and combine that with these other practices, such as adding a microbial food supplement, adding compost, adding a cover crop, no tillage, all those things also as a function of crop time of year, climate irrigation schedules. Right, like I said before, this becomes a knowledge-intensive program that sometimes can get a little heavy for people to say, well, can you "Just tell me what to do." Yeah. Right, and so you have to really think about, okay, how can we simplify this in terms of helping grow understand uh, what he or she needs to do when and where on their on their farm and what they what they think is best. This isn't a matter of us coming in and say, "Hey, we're from the government; we're going to help you." We generally try to understand with every grower we work with, okay, what what are your pain points? What problems do you have? What's your soil type? Uh, you know, and then determine that we actually can help. Because uh, we don't think we can, we're not going to go in there and try to put something in place that we don't feel is going to do them any good, or, or at least come back when we think we have a, a different solution for them. Right. What about in terms of time of application? A lot of people listening to this, they're transplanting crops. Is there a benefit, do you think, of using product growers or somebody else is a microbial type product at time of seeding if they're doing transplanting. So it's in contact with the roots as soon as the roots start forming and then they're transplanting that little cube of inoculated soil and root mass into the ground. Well, absolutely. I'm a big fan of that. You know, when anything that where we have a, a seed crop, a mother crop, strawberries, uh, blueberries, you know, things that are transplanted, and a lot of tomatoes and peppers are transplanted these days. I, I think the best program would, would be to inoculate them in the greenhouse and then transfer them and in the transplant water, have inoculum as well, and then maybe feed them again a, a third time uh, in order to, to truly get things going, especially if they, if they have, for example, fumigated their field, the strawberry grower. 
you know, because you're, you're basically wiping out everything, you know, once you do that. That's why if you get on a, a, a Z pack or something like that as a human, you better be taking a probiotic immediately after you do that to kind of reestablish what's going on. But I think absolutely uh, that's the way to go when you're doing those things. What about your, what are your thoughts on feeding the soil using something that we're adding as humans? So not by plants growing. I've heard people like Dan Kittredge mention things like, well, he might add some molasses or a sugar type spray to his soil if they've had really cloudy days. Photosynthesis is down. They've had a big stretch of that. You want to keep the microbes pumping. So he'll run sugar into the soil. Do you think that you could see a benefit of adding different microbial food sources to the soil just on their own? You're not adding microbes. You're just trying to feed the microbes that are there beyond. Yeah, the I, I think so. I mean, there, there's a company QL, QLF, Quality Liquid Feeds, uh, that that has molasses-based fertilizers, uh, and I know other people that are that are doing that. That's again, I, I, I'm being redundant with compost. That's what compost is. You're adding a food source as well as the microbe itself. Uh, but I, I do believe there are times, and you know, you, that particular example I hadn't heard before, but if you've got, you know, re cloud cover and reduced photosynthesis, yeah, that kind of makes sense that if it's reduced photosynthesis, you're probably not getting the flux of complex carbohydrates into the rhizosphere that you would otherwise. So why not tap it? If it, if it economically makes sense, why not put a, a little food source in there? Uh, I think one of the things we need to explore is, well, what kind of food source is best for what microbes? Uh, you know, molasses is pretty readily accessible, although there's a lot of reducing sugars in it, uh, versus uh, humic acid, which is a little bit more complex. You know, it's like eating uh, fiber instead of, you know, uh, uh, or whole wheat bread versus white bread, right? You know, because they say it's a little harder to digest. Or putting your potatoes, you know, in the refrigerator after you cook them to create more resistance to starch. Uh, that's uh, a little more difficult, so it doesn't impact to digest. It doesn't impact your glycemic index as much. I think we'll learn things like that with with those types of foods. And again, it comes back to you know trying to understand the microbial ecology and and having an easy way to measure those things. Because uh, I think we'll learn a lot from to to be able to optimize and and provide data for a question like that when we can when we can not only functionally understand that better, but do it such that the grower can actually do it on the back of their tailgate. So we've worked internally on a program to kind of develop something that, that's easy. You know, it's not going to do the grower much good if it costs them $500 an acre to do that kind of sampling, you know, and that their return is only $50 an acre. So we've, we've got to develop these tools and then scale them and get the cost down to where it makes sense and to where it's deployable on a field scale, you know, sending things back to the lab is fine right now, but you know, that's two weeks or you have to, you have to, to have a cheap enough sample that you, you can take enough samples to get rid of variants. Or if you just took one sample for field, well, what if your, what if your dog peed on that spot, you know, yesterday, uh, you, you know, it's, you, you need to be, be able to do enough sampling that that makes sense as well. And so, you know, people are looking at spectral reflectance and, you know, robotic probes and all kinds of things in order to scale it and reduce the cost. You know, with all your work with microbes over the years, are there off the shelf options that you think would be great for feeding microbes in the soil? You know, we've talked molasses, humic acid. Is there anything else that comes to mind? Is yeah, kelp, kelp extract is very good. We with a, we work with a company called Nature Source Three One One has a great product. It's a it's 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 a, it's a fermentation product of of, of uh, natural natural crop plants you know so and, and you know i think people are trying to best optimize what's in there you need some micronutrients you know you need a food source maybe some protein amino acids you know quote unquote protein protein hydrolysates uh in order to provide a complete food for the microbe that you're trying to feed or the endogenous microbes that you're trying to feed whether through the work that you all have done or any partners that you've worked with or anywhere you've worked in the past, do you find that there's common groups of microbes that tend to be missing in cultivated agricultural soils? Yeah, I, I wish I could answer that. I, I'll bet you other people that you have 
worked with could probably answer that better than me. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just beginning to try to take a look at things like that. In general, mo you know, trichoderma and, and, and mycorrhiza, for example, as fungi, and you might determine that I think those two are important in particular, and they are, but they're, you know, there are literally millions of bacterial species and hundreds of thousands of fungal species in every spoonful of soil. Uh, so it's a matter of, of what's there and at what population density and their ability to then get turned on. And so um, I think if you can, if you can, if we go back to that quorum sensing principle, that if you get the right band together, you know, with the right song, you know, you're gonna you're gonna wake up the right guys and girls and and have a have a fully functional uh, microbiome. So I don't I don't know if there's anything missing per se, uh, although I suspect there probably is. But I don't think we really know enough uh, yet to to kind of make that determination. And hopefully, some of these new tools will allow us to do that. And it's not necessarily even the microbe that's missing; it's the functionality. And so I, I'm beginning to think, too, that, that you may have a situation in certain, you know, say, northern soils versus southern soils, that you may find a particular fungi is missing in the northern soils that's present in the southern soils. You think, oh, I've got to add that microbe back. But what you really need to know, well, is the functionality present. It's quite likely that, that, a partic that microbe that's in the southern soil that's not in the northern soil might have a brother or a second cousin that's a different species or even a different genus that still provides that functionality. So we need that metabolomics function to tell that, oh, how about that? Those microbes have adapted. Something that grows better under those particular conditions, that particular climate, has become the dominant species to provide that function as opposed to one that, that is present in Louisiana or in Brazil. I, I don't have a lot of evidence of that, but I think when we get at the end of the day, we're going to find that's the case. When you guys arrived at something like trichoderma, why did you feel that was important to include in the mixture? Yeah, we did a lot of research uh, in terms of reading the literature. You know, my, my major professor in college, Bob Dindo, I says they call it research for a reason, right? <laughs> Somebody's generally done something. They don't call it search. Uh, and so, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Gary Harmon and Joe Klepper at Auburn, and I could go on and on in terms of people that have contributed to this. And so we tried to study, and then we added our own kind of, of mindset in terms of which strains to use and, and how to combine them. Uh, the necessity of keeping them fresh. You know, we sell our product as a, as a, as a cold chain. Uh, it's shipped cold to the grower in a, in a, in a cold pack and, and to optimize. We also produce it at very high densities and, and can do that economically so that we're applying absolutely fresh material at a high density, a combination of a fungi and a bacteria that, and, and also the microbial food supplement that we put with it. Yeah. So there's a certain amount of this that, that, you know, we, we learn by looking at the literature, but there's also a certain amount of it that we did that when we did the studies, we found that you wouldn't have expected those results. And so that combination of things that we, that we recommend to people, uh, uh, I think are unique to what we're trying to accomplish. Well, even based on that research, like, like what does trichoderma do as part of that soil metagenome? Like what, okay. what function wow. is that performing? Well, number one, fungi have a much larger genome than bacteria do, you know, prokaryote versus, say, eukaryote. Uh, we haven't talked about it yet, but certainly another important function here that's the other side of the coin of crop productivity is, is carbon sequestration. And as you know, we, we have a, a, a leading program called Carbon Now, where we're helping growers utilize Comet Farm, working with Nori in the carbon marketplace, and, and helping them just on their, their current and past regenerative practices, forget about rhizolyzer for a minute, in terms of helping them get compensated for their practices that have added carbon to the soil that wouldn't have been there had they not doing these particular regenerative practices. So back to trichoderma. Trichoderma is a, is a, is a eukaryotic fungi. And if you read the literature, most people will, not most, I say, I think that the pertinent literature will support the statement that you're going to get net carbon sequestration if you have high carbon use efficiency organisms. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. 
but generally a fungal dominant soil. What you want are organisms that when they consume the nutrients that are being exuded from the plant or that you're putting there or might be present in the soil already, turn that carbon into biomass as opposed to respired CO2. If it's a low carbon use efficiency organism that, that eats and you know, you know, respires and, and, and doesn't put on biomass, you're, you're, you're not going to do much for carbon accumulation in the soil. Uh, Stuart Grandy at the University of New Hampshire, uh, uh, Panjok uh, Trivedi at Colorado State. I mean, there are many others, uh, I think, are showing that, that that ratio of fungal to bacterial microbes or oligotrophs versus copiotrophs, as Panjak likes to call them, or high carbon use efficiency versus co low carbon use efficiency, as Stuart Grandy uses, is very important. And so adding trichoderma adds the ability to create a more fungal dominant soil. Uh, and for example, that's one of the reasons that minimum tillage or no tillage becomes important because fungi develop mycelia, uh, you know, yards, if not you know, maybe even miles of them. I don't know if you've ever seen a fairy ring in a forest. You know what that is? No. It's a, you know, it's a circle of mushrooms. Okay. And that circle can be three feet across or three miles across. Well, they're like an aspen forest. They're all one organism. Uh, and so the fungal hyphae are just an extended root system in terms of communicating with the plant. But as they consume those nutrients from the crop, they simply uh, add it on as biomass, and so that gets accumulated as organic matter. All organic matter is a microbial product. It may have originated in the plant, either as those nutrients or as fallen leaves or stems or what have you, but they generally have been processed by those microbes, especially the fungi, to, to then build up in the soil. So we think trichoderma is very important because it's a very powerful elicitor in terms of metabolites. That's I, I mentioned the paper by Gary uh, uh, Harmon, that he, and he's the father of trichoderma, if you want to put it that way. Other people have done some nice studies as well. Mycorrhiza is important as well, uh, but that fungi add a lot of genetic complexity. They are very good at converting sugars and plant material to microbial biomass, fungal biomass, that then gets deposited as carbon. And they're very good at converting those secretions to materials that also will help aggregate soil into micro and macro aggregates. That becomes a very important part of the story as well. Because what you see in generally a degraded soil, it's almost like dust. Uh, you know, it doesn't have a lot of structure to it. When you see a really healthy soil, it generally has a lot of structure, which, which generally means that it's good organic matter and has a lot of micro and macro aggregates. And those macro and micro aggregates are almost like housing, you know, condos for the microbes, because the microbes form those and they're inside of there and it helps protect them against degradation and, and helps hold moisture and helps with nutrient exchange, all kinds of interesting things. And, and fungi in particular have the genetic machinery to be able to stimulate all that. Can you talk a little bit about carbon sequestration? I've seen this come up in the comments. And I, I think this confuses some people and they don't fully understand this is how can you have plants and microbes sequester carbon in the soil when they're eating, respiring, and some of them respire carbon dioxide themselves, which is then going back up into the atmosphere. So if you're adding more microbes that respire CO2, how does it not net out to zero, and how are you actually sequestering that carbon dioxide into the soil or carbon into the soil through plant microbial interactions and not preventing the excess from going back up into the atmosphere? Yeah, okay, good point. Um, and it comes back to these high carbon use efficiency versus low carbon use efficiency organisms. So let's start at the top, literally. Uh, uh, atmospheric CO2. It's a resource for that plant. Plant are remarkable carbon pumps. They take carbon dioxide, uh, facilitated by photosynthesis, and turn it into complex carbohydrates that, that uh, uh, create stems, leaves, fruits, roots, a whole variety of things. 
And as I said before, depending on who you read or what crop, you know, you're getting at least 15 or 20 percent exudates, maybe up to 40 percent exudates out of that photosynthetic uh, complex material that's fed in to feed those microbes. Okay, so the microbes will concern that, and there are certain populations of microbes that, yeah, they're 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 not very efficient. They'll consume that. It's like a teenage boy, right? <laughs> Actually, maybe a teenage boy because they are growing. That's not a very good example. Maybe like me, right? Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll eat all this stuff and, and I'll just respire it out as, as CO2. But a, a young growing child will, will take this food in and they'll put body mass on as well. In other words, high carbon use efficiency. In other words, the amount of carbon they consume to the amount of body weight or biomass that they put on is very high, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, where you get certain organisms that will consume, you know, a kilogram of, of uh, the population will consume a kilogram of sugars and respire, you know, uh, uh, nine tenths of a kilogram out as CO2. We actually saw that when we did our initial studies with, with this gas met, you know, analyzer I mentioned earlier. It's a, it's a portable FTIR and you can measure nitrous oxide and you can measure carbon dioxide. Uh, emissions. And we were just out there trying to show to the grower that, that we were hopefully changing, you know, the soil. Because then with the citrus grower, you know, they get one look a year, right? They, they see the number of boxes that come off their field. And that's kind of, you know, their yearly testimony on, on whether what they're doing is getting better or worse. Well, we we're trying to do something to help them understand, you know, on a, on a more frequent basis, how they could think about their soil. And we, we put root traps in the ground. Uh, where we could, they're like a chicken wire column. You pull them up after six months or a year, and you could actually see, you know, the the differences in the root mass. Well, we wanted something else as well, so we were doing spectral reflectance and taking a look at chlorophyll density. But we thought, well, well let's take a look at soil respiration. Well, sure enough, we saw a 35% reduction in CO2 emissions and a 80% reduction in nitrous oxide emissions. And so, like. Holy cow! This is like my mom smelling soil, right? We just have a uh, an electronic sniffer, uh, and so we started reading about it and 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 thinking about it and doing some other studies. And, and what I have have come back with is this concept of high carbon use efficiency, low carbon use efficiency organisms. They were in place long before I started to take a look at this. I think the folks that I've you know talked about earlier have really done some remarkable work. And so if you have the wrong population of microbes. You're going to get a net respiration. If you have the right population of microbes, you're going to have net sequestration. And generally, people consider that right population of microbes for net sequestration to be fungal dominant or at least high carbon use efficiency dominant organisms. Right. So that carbon's going into like their hyphae in the mycelium, which are expanding out, which the above ground example is a tree, right? Like they absorb right. all that carbon in, they put it in the wood. That wood's not going anywhere till eventually one day it does where underground so if you can keep getting these fungal hyphae growing longer and longer spreading out further and further that's where you're storing all this carbon right and it's it's not a good analogy but you know there's c3 versus c4 uh photosynthesis plants a c3 plant will respire there's photorespiration you know at night plants respire co2 well, a C4 plant has a malic acid pathway. Well, they'll capture one of those CO2s and put it into a C4, a four carbon molecule to, to keep it from escaping. And they're a little bit more photosynthetically efficient because of that. So the same thing down below that, you know, uh, nature abhors a, uh, uh, you know, inefficiency. So those microbes become very important. Therefore, it becomes very important to do those things necessary from an agricultural practice perspective to try to create a more fungal dominant or at least high CUE dominant soil so that you can ag aggregate or accumulate carbon as opposed to degrade it and respire it. Might be outside your wheelhouse, but are you aware of any soil microbes that absorb large amounts of CO2? So if you have ones that are taking it in, Yet respiring it off, I'm thinking, okay, well, again, there's got to be this natural balance. What's sucking that extra CO2 up in the soil? Are there microbes that are CO2 feeders? Well, I would never say no, uh, but you're right. It's a little bit outside my wheelhouse. I'm not aware of one. There are chemical processes like uh, calcium carbonate, you know, you know, 
rock formation that will geologically capture carbon. But off the top of my head, and I'll, I'll, I'll look into it and I'll email you if I find something, but at this particular point in time, you know, I can't off the top of my head give, give an example of a microbe that's doing that. Other, well, I take that back. I was at blue-green algae, you know, cyanobacteria. They definitely would be an example of that. They have photosynthetic apparatus, uh, they're soil dwelling, and they certainly would, would consume CO2, have a degree of archaic photosynthesis, and convert that. What I don't know is what their carbon use efficiency would be. Right. So there we go. I feel proud of myself. I, <laughs> a brain cell clicked, right? Well, yeah. I heard somebody reference on a past podcast. I can't remember who it was, but they said something along the lines of, of part of what's helping plant growth is that CO2 respired from microbes in the soil as it comes back. Well, the yeah, I, you know, I have a good friend, Tony Michaels, that I worked with at Pegasus Capital Advisors, and I worked with in Hawaii, and he actually was the CEO of Midwestern BioAg. And Tony always felt as though when you have a, a good canopy, like say soybeans or corn, and you, had a, and you had a higher CO2 density under the canopy than above it, because of that soil respiration, you were going to get greater yield. Um, I, I don't know if I buy that or not. It makes sense, right? Uh, but I guess it, you know, it's a matter of equilibrium constants. And to me, especially now that we're beginning to monetize soil carbon for growers, uh, I, I think keeping as much carbon in the ground is more important than trying to boost your yields by a few percentage points by, by creating a, a, not that Tony was suggesting this, you know, he's going to slap me silly if he listens to this. <laughs> uh, not that Tony was suggesting that, okay, you need to, to prime the soil to, to do nothing, but, but, you know, respire CO2. Yeah. But I think it's an, it's an economic trade-off and, and, you know, at fifteen dollars a ton, and you know the wonders of Comet Farm, and you know our ability to truly monetize this. As you know, we 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 actually were able to organize a payment from Spotify to one of our growers a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's a sea change. I think we're we're going to be able to to further incentivize growers to adopt regenerative practices because it's going to create a second crop crop for them. Carbon. Yeah, can you and, talk a little bit about that? Because that's this is something I think we're we're just really getting into the brink of out there as an industry. And I'll go back to an interview I did with Joel Salatin back in like 2013. And he, he talked about, you know, wouldn't it be great, you know, on the Wall Street Journal, if it said, you know, like the total number of earthworms per cubic foot of soil versus what the Dow did. And we're kind of getting here in a way right. with the amount of carbon sequestered. Can you talk about where that industry is right now with farmers and companies looking to offset carbon emissions where's that intersection what's that industry look like and where do you think it's going right okay so uh, i always start with talking about Raton law you know the professor at ohio state university uh won the food prize this year and the japan prize last year for his work on soil carbon he he is the father of of a lot of these principles many many other people globally working on this but he's a good person to quote in particular that he you know he estimated that agricultural soils globally have lost about 1.35 billion tons of carbon over the last 100 years 120 years and that if all we did was put that back the calculation is that that would be worth 65 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. So 415 to, uh, 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 what is that, 350. That's a big deal, right? Now, a lot of people will say, well, look, you can only pack so much carbon in, a, in, a, in, in, in the soil. You can't put 10 pounds of manure in a five-pound bag. Well, I, I, number one, I think we're a long way from getting to that point, and that agricultural soils represent the world's most scalable solution to climate mitigation. And oh, by the way, putting carbon in soil is a good deal. Unlike carbon being absorbed into the, the ocean where it destroys productivity, increased carbon in, in agricultural soils increases productivity. It's a good thing for lots of different reasons. Now, on the flip side of this, you see every week another company committing to be carbon neutral by 2030, 2040, 2050. 
are committing billions of dollars to, to, to stimulate this. And there are lots of groups, the Carbon Underground, the Soil Health Institute, you know, many organizations that we could name that are dedicated to, to improving this. Um, and what is important, I think, and I've worked on policy, I'm a member of a group called E2, the Environmental Entrepreneurs, that is aligned with the NRDC, the National Resources Defense Council. And I was part of a small group that, that went to the Senate Ag Committee in 2017, and, and we were with the National Corn Growers and myself, there were about six of us, and we talked to folks about getting language in the farm bill to incentivize soil health. And we, along with other people uh, that were promoting that, were successful. You see language in that. And it provides funds through you know, Conservation Service and other USDA programs for people to embrace and study and adopt regenerative soil practices, because we understand one of the best ways of increasing soil carbon is to implement these regenerative practices. But what really, you know, I, I think incentivizing people, uh, you know, works really well in that if, if there were marketplaces, and there are now, we work with Nori, which is a carbon marketplace, which works with Spotify, as an, excuse me, Shopify, which is the company we were working with, and others, companies that have committed to be carbon neutral and realizing that, okay, look, I can, I can, I can try to lower the number of miles my service trucks drive, or I can shut off the lights in our building, or put in LEDs as opposed to incandescent, you know. You can do a lot to reduce emissions, but if you're truly going to become carbon neutral or even carbon negative, you've got to have drawdown. And agricultural soils are the best bet for drawdown. So why not stimulate agriculture to amplify what they're doing and to optimize what they're doing by paying them uh, for the carbon that they're putting in soil? And so there are companies like Indigo, they're funding this on their own balance sheet. Uh, the Climate Action Reserve is working with people, Vera, you know, registries that are, that are involved in, in authorizing and, and, and doing things along these lines. But Nori is a really good example of an of a, of a entity that is creating a marketplace which is bringing interested buyers together with validated sellers of carbon. And they work with Comet Farm, which is a USDA program developed at Colorado State University by Keith Postian and his group. And you, you know, it's 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 a huge metadata base of soil types, nutrient tillage practices, all kinds of things that the grower fills out into a platform, and then that metadata base uses artificial intelligence to project the amount of carbon that's sequestered versus if they had not been doing those things. Uh, and of course, it has to be validated by a third party, and and we just completed that process with one grower, Kelly Garrett in Iowa, was a very progressive grower, and he was authorized for 20,000 metric tons of carbon over the last five years. The neat thing about the Nori program, it's retrospective. It pays for the last five years of what has been going on, uh, and it's a 10-year contract they signed. And so he was able to market that. A certain portion of them, I don't think he marketed the whole thing right now, at $15 per ton. And at 20,000 tons, at $15 a ton, that's a nice check. And it's, it, you know, I think growers are becoming very excited. Uh, there are other programs out there for them to look into where they can now begin to think about their, their farm economics, not only about optimizing yield and quality, but optimizing soil carbon as well. And the really remarkable thing about that, as I said earlier, there are two sides of the same coin. When you get a more productive crop, you generally get more soil carbon sequestration, especially if, if it's accomplished with a variety of regenerative agricultural practices, which in the end is what we're doing because that's what built soil health. And soil health is what keeps the whole system sustainable, that we'll have, we'll have healthy soils or increased soils as opposed to diminished soils over the next 100 years as opposed to 1.35 billion tons that, that you know, Professor Lau you know, is estimated that we have lost over the last hundred years. I'm sure you've watched uh, uh, Kiss the Ground, you know, the Woody Harrelson documented, and, and he mentions in there that people say, well, we only have 60 years of harvest left, and then the soil is going to be gone. 
well, that's a scary number, right? I, 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 I think we can, we can slow that down. I think we can reverse it. I think we can build it back the other way. I think we can grow soil, as Ray Archuleta says in that same film, by these things. And I think the best way to stimulate the speed at which that happens is to incentivize growers by, you know, rewarding them for the carbon they put in the ground. And that's happening right now. And is I think this, our Carbon Now program is a great example of that. Is this the pendulum then that, that starts to swing, where it starts to swing the other way? Before, I, I think a lot of conventional ag farmers maybe felt trapped, for lack of a better word, is, well, I could do other practices, but I'm trying to pay the bills. You know, I switch off. I, I'm going to take a hit on yield during this transition where if you're now have the ability to start getting paid for sequestering that carbon to a different method. Does this ease some of that land tradition moving over? It's easy, the adoption of different practices. Yeah, you know, as I said, I've you know I graduated you know from college in 1976. I grew up on a farm. I graduated with my PhD in 1980. That's a long time ago. I would still repeat the same thing I told you before. You know, I worked on con you know conservation tillage practices in eastern Colorado. Uh, my first job at the University of Kentucky as a weed scientist, we did a lot of work on that trash farming I talked about. I just, I just don't buy into the fact that growers you know, consciously made decisions to optimize yield over soil health. I mean, a lot of those people went through the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Um, they, they used the best tools available to them, and as new tools have become available and new knowledge, it gets rapidly adopted. So what's going on now is I think especially with the ability to monetize carbon sequestration, we're going to see even more rapid adoption of practices. And we're going to see how to amplify even beyond typical regenerative practices with microbial soil amendments or who knows what other remarkable technology might become available uh, to, to continue down this path where, where a grower is now optimizing both his above ground yield as well as his below his or her below ground yield in terms of soil carbon sequestration, which then ultimately you know, gets rid of the 60 years, you know, 60 harvest lefts, you know, extend it to the next 10,000 years. I, you know, I was the CEO of Hawaii Bioenergy back in 2009, 10, 11. Uh, and it was a consortium of, of Hawaiian landowners, one of which was Kamehameha Schools, which is the largest landowner in Hawaii. And when I came in uh, to interview, they didn't ask me about the economics or anything else. What they asked, they said, all right, look, we've been here for a thousand years. These are in native Hawaiians. What are you going to do to make sure that our land is as is, is, is productive and supportive of our community a thousand years from now as it was a thousand years ago? And I was like, wow, that's, that's a really good question. And it really speaks to what we're talking about right now. I mean, people have been aware of this for thousands of years. Uh, now we're just we're getting a handle on how to implement it such that it makes sense. We have the knowledge. We have the tools to measure it. We can improve upon it. We can decide uh, about technology that we may have adopted and embraced in the 60s and 70s that just doesn't make as much sense now. Uh, we can improve varieties. We can create these microbial communities. And I, I think you'll see broad recognition because all growers are natural stewards of their land. It's their legacy. Uh, it's what you depend upon. It's like my mother smelling her soil every morning. Yeah, you know, there's a grower I know who doesn't doesn't think about his soil. hasn't thought about his soil for the last sixty years. Do you think we're we're close to a day where any farmer, regardless of scale, will? be able to have access to a marketplace to sell their carbon sequestration credits? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right now, there is a thousand acre limit on the Nori platform, you know, a, a, a floor, but growers can, can form a, a coalition to add 100 acres at a time, 50 acres at a time, and create a, a thousand acre entity in order to do that. Uh, I'm involved right now. Uh, I, I was a, a director of a company called Godavari for 13 years in India. Uh, it has one of the largest sugarcane processing facilities in, in India that they turned then turned into renewable chemistry. Uh, they make sugar and power as well, but they make a lot of chemicals from renewable resources. 
Yeah, I'm now a, a, a board member of the Karnataka Institute, KIAR, K I A A R, of agriculture, Applied Agricultural Research, KIAR. I'm a director, I should know, <laughs> know what the name stands for. But, uh, you know, in India, you're lucky if you have five acres. There's a law, you can only have so much. And people, People collaborate to do things. Well, we're trying. I'm working with Larry Walker, who's working with Michigan State, uh, with Samaya Vidyavihar University and Kiar, to to deploy these practices in India, which is kind of ironic because I actually think Indian growers are already there. They already do a lot, of, a lot of cover crops and and composting and things like that. I think we can learn from them. But what we can do is potentially allow them to monetize what they've been doing for a while as well. The one thing that I think is really an equity right now, you know, with the concept of additionality on soil carbon sequestration, for example, in, in, in the, the, the uh, Nori program, if you've been doing it for more than 10 years, you, you're disqualified. That's, that's, that's almost everywhere. They have that kind of thing. Well, you got to do something different. Well, why punish the people that have been ahead of the game for 50 years? Right. That's got to change. And I, I fully plan to, you know, through my policy and, and advocacy routes, you know, advocate to, you know, get rid of that. It just, it makes no sense to me whatsoever. We want to keep people doing it, but why punish people that have been ahead of, ahead of their time for a long period? But that's a whole nother hour long conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting future for, for people that want to learn more about the different services you have to offer. They want to learn about Rhizolizer and, and try that or get access to that. How can they do that? Yeah, well, number one, the Rhizolizer Carbon Now is our carbon program. And again, uh, an unabashed promotion here. I know we were going to talk about science, but we are the first company to truly monetize at scale soil carbon for one of our growers. And we're very proud of that because it's an important contribution to society. It's an important contribution to the grower and important to us. But you can learn more about Locus at www.locusag.com. So L-O-C-U-S-A-G.com. And you can send a note. You know, people like Teresa DeJohn, who you met, will get that immediately. I'll get it. Our staff will get it and, and we'll answer right away whether you're interested in, in what we have today available through Pantago and Rhizolizer, our Carbon Now program, or just general advice as to, gosh, I'm interested in regenerative agriculture. Who can you connect me to that's local to me? Because we try to help people understand if, if we can't help them, well, who can? Right. And a lot of people listening to this, I mean, they might be that Indian equivalent sub five acre farmer, you know, is that the size farmer you deal with absolutely i you know you know i have a you know i told you i grew up on a farm in oregon i didn't tell you how many acres i don't think we had more than 10 acres maybe 30 acres and at times my mom would lease a little bit more but you know growing specimen mugo pines and azaleas and rhododendrons you didn't need a lot of land but you know my mom was born in 1912 grew up through the depression a couple of world wars you know, and she, she was her own person, you know, managing that farm, that operation. I, I can remember getting up at four in the morning, you know, unloading a truckload of Tam junipers and going to school then being told to get home right away because I had to plant those Tam junipers, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, and, 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 and go on from there. So I, I think rural America, rural anywhere is, is very important. And there are a lot of large corporate farms, 10, 50,000 acres, but there's an awful lot of people that are small growers as well. And, you know, just my own comment here, I, I think agriculture is a pathway to peace. Uh, agriculture is the foundation of a free society. Here we are, in a, you know, right now in the midst of our election, we have a remarkably democratic society. And I think it's because we have so many great resources in terms of our soils, so we need to protect them, our ability to produce food. You know, hungry people are anarchists. And I think, you know, as, as a nation, we have gone out unabashedly trying to help people, you know, in Africa, in India, uh, in Korea, all over the place to help them to better understand how to, how to grow food. And I think what we're understanding now is that if, if there's certainly a scarce resource that we need to protect, it's soil. And that, that we're developing the knowledge either through like the Comet Farm Program, which is a USDA NRCS program or other mechanisms. Uh, we have a remarkable aggregation of knowledge that we can share people. Now the key is, well, how do we make it understandable and simple so that people can, can quickly adopt it? 
And then if we can incentivize them or reward for them for that adoption through the soil carbon programs, awesome. All the better. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.